Cool. All right, I'll go ahead and boot her up. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another interview with Chris Ferguson, the researcher at Stetson University who studied Gamergate. Um, in part one, we went over a large portion of his study of Gamergate with Brad Glasgow. In part two, we discussed, well, Gamergate and some other topics. Part three, we're going to be discussing Gamergate, of course. Maybe we'll finish the interview tonight, maybe not. Um, but we have some <laughs> updates here and some interesting things. So um, before we jump in, uh, Chris published a paper with some other researchers in December of last year about Resident Evil. We're going to go over that in a little bit, but we do have some Sweet Baby Inc. updates. I do want to make sure that those are included in the book, plus it's good content. So, um, <laughs> All right, so uh, first Sweet Baby Inc. update. Alyssa Mercante, the writer for Kotaku, uh, she's the one who wrote the article that complete that where she interviewed Kim Belair, the CEO of Sweet Baby Inc., and she wrote about how well, there's a conspiracy theory about this company promoting a progressive gaming agenda, uh, which they do openly pr do. But she she left out the part where the Sweet Baby Inc. employees harassed Cabrutus, even though she knew this information. It is now confirmed, insofar as these things can be, I suppose, that she did know this information. Uh, she was on, on the, She interviewed a user from the Sweet Baby Inc. detected Discord group called COD, and COD has shared the DMs with Side Scrollers Podcast. Side Scrollers Podcast ran with this, and she knew that Cabrutus was the victim of the harassment campaign, not Sweet Baby Inc. But she tried to reverse it for some reason in her article. Do you have any thoughts on on that happening? What I mean, when I watch all these things go on, I mean, I'm always like impressed by like the 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 levels, like the onion levels of inside baseball that always happen with these things. Like you know, the personalities that are involved. You know, I mean, a lot of this stuff just feels like middle school a little bit i mean i mean do you have that feeling at all when you when you watch the stuff like just people that don't like each other and are talking about each other behind their backs and and um and, and all of this i don't know I mean, do you get that sense um to some extent but i i, I don't think it's i don't think it's equal i don't think it's it's one-sided I, I i don't mm -hmm. think it's both sides doing it you know obviously you can find youtubers i'm sure who would be like, oh, yeah. I'm going to talk bad about this person behind their back. But yeah, the fact yeah. is, these people, they claim to be professional journalists. They are, yeah, their yeah. full-time job is to be a journalist. They yeah. had information. They deliberately misled the public about that information, yeah. knowingly. And now, and, and the, this the Cabrutus, he's just a normal guy living in Brazil. You know, he's a Brazilian yeah, gamer. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. not shit-talking anybody. He's literally right, just chilling right. out. He's playing his games. He made a list of of games that Sweet Baby Inc. worked on. I don't think it's really comparable. I don't think that both sides are are necessarily engaged in the same kind of catty behavior. But yeah. this sort of catty behavior, I do think that the the journalists are engaged with it. And I'm sure you can find some YouTubers or some yeah. you know independent media people who have been irresponsible. Of course, you know there's yeah. always going to be someone. But I, I do think that the professional journalists do have an obligation to be ethical, and so do the YouTubers too. Theoretically, yes. <laughs> but I mean, we we see that you know even in like mainstream journalism that ha that's been a problem, right? You know, and and, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think that like sites like you know Kotaku or other other sites, and I and I think we talked about this somewhat before in some of the other interviews. I mean, they, they've gone so down the rabbit hole with these things, you know, um, that you know dating back. To the you know original Gamergate in in, in 2014, there were obvious conflicts of interest in what they were reporting uh, for you know for themselves. I mean, they were protecting their own asses and creating a narrative that cast themselves positively and you know and cast you know uh, you know again criticizing harassment's fine, but you know sort of blowing that up and and using that to destroy or smear an entire you know movement that was critical of, of some of their practices i mean that, that that was such an obvious conflict of interest so, i mean I, I tend to see a lot of this is as as just part of that larger trend that games journal i mean there's lots of things going on games journalism just protecting themselves a lot of the people that write in that field come out of 
you know, certain types of college programs that have a particular political narrative. Uh, so their articles are written to reflect that political narrative, even though it doesn't necessarily connect with the majority of gamers necessarily. So I don't know. I mean, there, there's just something like completely pathological, I think, at this point in how games journalism has evolved over the past decade, at least. And I, I don't know. I don't see a lot of I, I don't see them getting out of it in the near future um, at this point. Um, you know, maybe there's some good outlets out there somewhere, but I'm, I'm sort of struggling to think of a mainstream outlet, you know, even like Wired or something like that, that, that isn't experiencing some of these problems. So, Well, it, it, this it seems like there's this it, it doesn't just seem like I, I think it's basically like been confirmed for about a decade now. There's like this clique of people who all hold this super like far left on social issues, at least ideology. Yeah. And they've mm -hmm. sort of like taken over the games for us and other aspects yeah. in society too, you could say. And yeah. they don't seem to be open to having conversations with people. Like you said, people talking behind each other's backs. Alyssa Mercante, yeah. um, I've reached out to her now four times over the course of my life basically in the course of the past month. Um, and I've, yeah. I've, she's got an open invitation to come on the show. Uh, when I talked with her on the stream of corruption, I had just reached out to her. She claimed that she got a harassing message um, from somebody, never provided any evidence of this, um, except for a screenshot of a, of <laughs> with the name blocked off of, of someone saying yeah. you should hang. And it's like, well, anybody could make a screenshot like that in two minutes, you know, and paint. I could do that. Right. So there's no real evidence of any harassment. That's the only thing that's been provided. And you're claiming, oh, I'm horrible. There's thousands of evil gamers coming to destroy my life. Yeah. And I'm like, well, look. Yeah. So I sent her an email. And I'm like, look, um, I'm going to be talking about this. I want, I, you know, if you want to send me evidence, um, send me the evidence and we can go over it on air or we can come on my show and we can talk about it. She has an open invitation. Um, same, mm -hmm. with, same with all these people. Uh, yeah. But they they don't talk to the to to people who they don't like. If you're outside yeah. of their clique, they're not going to have a conversation. I think that's like the fundamental issue. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's because you're bad. That's that's you're the bad person. You're on the bad side. You know that that definitely is you know the the narrative. That's part of humanity. We all you know uh, we all have this tendency to see uh, you know things in black and white and you know our side and the evil side and and all that stuff. But yeah, I mean I mean this this has been talked about in other places and you know the, the you know most of these. You know, folks that end up in journalism careers, including at like the New York Times or Washington Post. I mean that you know, uh, there's so little money in it. You know, and you end up with people that mostly went to you know fairly elite universities. You know, particularly for the mainstream press, maybe a little bit less for games journalism. But you know, yeah, got degrees in literature or I don't know some kind of humanities. Um, you know. Uh, and uh, you know, find out there's not a lot of jobs <laughs> for for that, you know, um, and and ended up uh, they they you know maybe they have family who are still willing to kind of take care of them, you know, uh, financially at least for some period of time, even into their twenties when they theoretically have a, a career, uh, and so they you know they all come from these you know university backgrounds that are very humanities focused, you know, for the most part. Uh, I know I'm inviting like one person to say, but wait, I've got a physics degree and I write games. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I'm just talking in terms of general trends here. Um, and, uh, you know, they've, they've been brought up with a particular narrative. They've been brought up in a particular political environment. They've been taught to problematize everything, you know. Uh, and if you have that mindset, you can find the problem in everything uh, if, if you're incentivized to do so and you feel like your job depends upon you doing so. And... Uh, and they think they're the good people. Uh, you know, they think they're um, part of some sort of, um, what would it be, uh, you know, um, reckoning about race or identity that most of us have come to acknowledge is, isn't actually happening. <laughs> that probably was out of false pretense anyway. Um, but they're still stuck with it, right? Because that gives them this sort of sense of, of, of importance. And anybody that in any way, even relatively minor, um, you know, so I'm like, I'm not a conservative, you know, I, 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 I would like to see a, an egalitarian world in terms of race and sex and, and you know, and, and uh, sexual identity and all that, all kinds of other stuff. Um, but uh, any, any, you know, critique or pushback or debate about these kinds of quasi-religious beliefs is met with a lot of hostility. So, 
Um, and, like, and like I said, it has a sort of like middle schoolish tone. I mean, it's like the hall monitors, right? You know, these are the people that have, have some kind of moral power, they think, um, and use it um, fairly aggressively, fairly authoritarian, you know, and that's why you get a lot of anti-free speech and, um, you know, anti-due process and some of these movements. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been, it's been garbage, right? You know, and I, and I think that's shown, me my impression, like I said, I stopped reading a lot of games journalism probably about 10 years ago, but, uh, my impression is that a lot of these outlets, I think, including Kotaku, have not been doing very well financially. So I, I think that should be a red flag for some of these outlets that they're off base with their, you know, essentially their readers, but uh, for some reason uh, that that financial reality hasn't kicked in for them, and they're still doing this stuff. So, well, and it's interesting you mentioned that because Kotaku in particular, there was a a story that came out a few days ago that Kotaku the they had a, this the C, the editor in chief resigned because mm -hmm. there was the, the the executives are really not happy with the way Kotaku is being run apparently. And so yeah. they want to shift the focus away from this sort of games journalism, like in the, in like the, I guess the, the, whatever they're doing now, shift it yeah. away from that and move it more towards doing game guides. Okay. And they wanted to do 50 guides a week. Um, but oh, there was a game? revolt from this. They, they have seven staffers from what other people have yeah. said. Um, seven staffers making 50 guides a week. The seven number comes from Nathan Grayson, a former employee of them. Yeah. But the staff apparently revolted against this idea. They weren't happy about having to play video games and make the guides based on these games, 50 of them yeah. a week. So they, they yeah. apparently protested this decision, and the company has backed off a little bit and said, okay, we're going to allow you to do some games journalism at least. So okay. it looks like they are considering moving in a different direction possibly. Well, they could they could do both and see which ones people actually click, you know. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I can tell you, I do a lot more, uh, you know, especially with some of these games I've been playing in recent years, you know, the Elden Ring and uh, Baldur's Gate three and that kind of stuff. That yeah, I actually the the games guides are helpful. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're actually useful. From I have no idea what the hell was going on in Elden Ring, um, and uh, so you know, being on the read some of these things sometimes is is, is are, are useful. Where you know, I don't really want to hear about how problematic Elden Ring is for some progressive cause, you know, or that kind of thing. I'm just not interested. I'm just not going to click on that, you know. Uh, I mean, so they could they could run that experiment, right? You know, have this. You know, everybody gets assigned 50% to games journalism versus video game guides. We publish them all, you know, at the same time of the day, you know, across the week, and then uh, see who clicks on them, you know, and then, we, then you have a sense of which ones are more, you know, profitable. I mean, I guess it, it was it. The only thing I could say maybe is uh you know maybe there already are a number of companies that do game guides um I'm trying to think of like i think ign does some and i'm trying to now look up Elden ring real quick the ign to see polygon does them i think as well um right yeah so it might it might be a crowd yeah ign um da, 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 the gamer uh game looks facts, like they do. of course well game facts is yeah. they don't they don't do guides they allow users to make their own um yeah yeah, PC Gamer. Yeah, okay, I'm just seeing some that are doing it. So Euro Gamer. Yeah, so there may be a few that, um, you know, and of course Steam sometimes has some as well. But they, they might already, they, it might be a crowded space. That's the only thing I can think of. It might be the downside to it. But uh, but yeah, but I, but I do think they need to do something. You know, I think that, you know, and, and, and you know, in fairness, I mean, Kotaku is, is a known name. You know, so if they could sort of shift their brand to something that people wanted, they might be able to, you know, still make benefit of their name recognition um, and do things that are interested. I mean, and I think they, they could do games journalism. It's not, it's not so much that they're doing uh, ga doing games journalism is bad. It's just that they're doing bad games journalism, you know? Um, and I think they could even, even with the games journalism shift their identity or their brand away from this like moral hectoring uh, and, you know, inside baseball personality fights that, you know, I don't think most gamers care about for the most part. Um, that, uh, yeah, and just, and just did like, you know, here are, you know, the real issues like back when they did, uh, you know, maybe some of your, you know, um, listeners or viewers are too young to remember, but the, you know, Kotaku did some good stuff back with like the violent video game debate. I'm talking like, you know, uh, you know, mid to late aughts and, you know, maybe even the early teens, you know, um, you know, sort of talk about things that were fairly balanced and they had some pretty good, you know, uh, journalists that aren't there anymore, of course, but. 
uh, that did some pretty good work. Um, and, and, you know, and it was around the time of the original Game of Gate, you know, around 2013, 2014, when, you know, basically everything shifted in society that, uh, they kind of moved on to this, you know, we really need to talk about X in game Y, you know, kind of, uh, headline sort of thing. And it's always something about like, if you play this game, you know, you're contributing to some bad moral cause and some, right. You know, so you can't have fun anymore. Right? You just can't play a game and have fun with it. You know, even if it's, you know, it got some controversial material, it's just like, you know, everything has to be for a moral cause. And, uh, you know, and I, and I, and I think the, the origin point of that is, is academia, to be honest with you. I think that's all part, in part because of how universities shifted into, you know, filling kids' heads with this, this stuff, you know. And particularly if you're white, you know, that to be, you know, good and white, uh, you have to always be, you know, engaged in this ongoing moral reckoning crusade about race and identity and all this other kind of stuff. And um, and some, you know, some mostly rich, you know, white kids get suckered into this, you know, and uh, even though they're still living very, you know, privileged lives in terms of class, you know, and things like that, uh, now they can pick on, you know, other people who are lower class, and that might be other whites, or it might be, you know, non-whites, you know, black people, Latino people, Asian people who don't agree with them, whatever, you know, they bec they've cast themselves as the moral guardians, you know, and that is uh, satisfying, I'm sure it feels good, um, but it doesn't make for good journalism, you know, uh, for the for the most part. I think we've seen that even in, new, in, in mainstream journalism where, you know, thankfully even like the New York Times has kind of gotten the hint and shifted away from its, you know, sort of moral clarity position from the late teens and, you know, early 20s and into something a bit more nuanced. And, and hopefully that, that, that trend will continue into the future. Yeah, and like like you said, it's it's there's obviously games journalism. I think it could be important. It could be interesting. It could be useful. Um, and there's a lot of people doing it. They're just not working for places like Kotaku. Uh, they're like independent right. people. I mean, Jason Schreier occasionally does get a story, but but it's mostly independent people. People who have connections yeah. with developers. People who are exposing different corrupt practices in the industry. I think that 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 can be important. But that's not what they're doing. Like unfortunately. I have pulled up on screen right here. Alyssa Mercante, the same person from Kotaku, says, yeah. there's a story I've been simmering that I really want to pick back up again. If anyone has any connections to a prominent female Twitch streamer slash gaming personality who leans very hard into Christianity and homophobia, DM me or email me at link in bio. So she says this, and every, people... There's a very famous streamer who does meet this sort of description, or not even famous, but like moderately sized streamer, I guess, yeah. who meets this description that everybody sort of realized, oh, wait, she's talking about Melanie Mack, a very specific person. And yeah, yeah. it seems like, like you said, they're just, they just want to bully this person. And look, I don't agree with Melanie Mack's views, um, but yeah. I believe in free speech. I don't believe in sure. harassing people. I don't believe in doxing them. I don't believe anything like that. I believe in debating them. So if Melanie Mack wants yeah. to have a conversation... I'll debate yeah. her on the topics, um, but I'm not going to I'm not going to sit here and try and write hit pieces on her to destroy her life. And she didn't even reach out to Melanie for comments either. Right. Right. Which right. is ridiculous. Which is odd. Yeah, that's odd. Yeah. Now, the yeah, piece yeah. hasn't come out yet. Maybe it's going to be like a glowing praise of like, this is the greatest streamer <laughs> of all time. But like, I don't think that's going to be the case, most likely. Yeah. No, I don't, and and that's what I, that's what I really meant about like the, the the feeling of middle school, like like I like I actually I had that tweet up actually, believe it or not, um, and uh, I see it, and and that feels just like there's a girl we don't like. Let's all get together and talk about how we don't like her, you know, kind of a thing. It's like really, that's 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 a, that's a news article, you know, is like there's a bunch of people that don't like this girl, you know, uh, sort of thing, and. I mean, what is, is there, I mean, I don't know, maybe I'm not, is there a big audience for this? I mean, I guess it's like, you know, popcorn and soda in a way, you know, it's gossipy uh, sort of stuff, but it doesn't feel like, you know, it's tabloid, right? I mean, well, it's, but, it's but, but, but Unfortunately, though, I know it's, we, you want to dismiss it, I want to dismiss it, be like, oh, it's tabloid garbage. And it, it is tabloid garbage, but does the tabloid garbage get views? Because, yeah. because you know that, a lot of people who are fans of Melanie Mac, a lot of people who are random people, they're going to click on the article and hate read it. And that's yeah. going to get views. True, true, yeah. And then also, like, I know I know a lot of live streamers. I know, I know some live streamers. 
at least, who have transitioned away from being serious debate people, people who are serious mm-hmm. researchers who want to who want to do debates and, and prep and study topics before they talk about them. And then they're like, you know what? Actually, I can probably get more views if I just talk about drama. And so that's what they focus on. And like, that's yeah. fine. Like they're allowed to do that. But like, yeah, it seems like maybe their people are incentivized to go for these low hanging fruit drama type articles or videos rather than going for like well-researched good material and good videos, good articles, etc. Yeah. Well, this definitely isn't that, right? I mean, she literally is just saying, you know, let's, I mean, DM me <laughs> with, with your gossip about this person that I don't like, uh, you know, give, give me good gossipy stories, you know, that kind of stuff. So it, it, it doesn't, you know, I mean, I mean, I'm not a journalist, maybe I don't know, but this doesn't feel like a, a well-researched story. I mean, at least, you know, if, if, if you were doing a uh, narrative piece about Melanie Mack, you know, you probably would want people to have varying views about Melanie Mack, first of all. I mean, yeah, if there are these accusations that she's homophobic or whatever, I mean, fine. You know, you did talk to people that have that view, but are there also people that defend Melanie Mack's position? You know, like you said, you probably ought to talk to Melanie Mack you know, as, a, as part of this whole thing. And, and uh, you know, and let, let the information take you where it takes you. Um, you know, let, let the story... Yeah, you, you, you as a journalist, you should be the uh, what is I don't know the, you know the uh, the aid to the story in a way you know the person that gives it words you know rather than deciding what the story is um, you know from the you know from the beginning but uh, but I mean you can kind of from that that tweet you know by uh, Mercante I mean you know the whole leans very hard into Christianity and homophobia that. Uh, which is interesting. She threw the Christianity part in, you know. I mean, I, who 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 cares necessarily if someone's big into into Christianity? Um, but uh, I think she's implying that the Christianity and the homophobia are linked, <laughs> you know. Which you know, in some cases that may be true, but uh, but but it it does have this feeling of you know they're sort of like the good agnostic liberal progressive on one side of these kind of debates and the bad you know christian nationalist homophobic on the other side of 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 these things and uh and uh, yeah i mean this is a witch hunt i mean you're basically just looking for people that don't like this person yeah i mean she could have worded it as you know i'm I'm gonna write a story about melanie mack if there's anybody that has any inside you know thoughts about her and her show or, or her, her twitch stream you know then dm me she could have worded it more neutrally right you know but this is clearly looking for you know dirt and negative stories about melanie mack rather than telling a well-balanced story about melanie mack and i i don't watch melanie mack's show or, or yeah or me either I, really maybe either. i don't know anything about her so uh maybe she said maybe she has said homophobic well, things i, I, I don't, don't i don't know, know if she's yeah. ever I, I don't know if she said homophobic things. I know that she's like very anti-trans. Um, mm-hmm. She's made that a big part of her like personality online as a streamer. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, again, free speech, you know, if she wants to have a discussion, she wants to have a debate, that's how you should approach it. Not this, oh, give me your juicy gossip on this person. That's so, it's so childish, you know, I've read it. You know, yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, unfortunately, we're still stuck on Alyssa Mercante because the next story partially involves her. <laughs> uh, CBC. Now, I, to be clear, I've reached out to everybody involved in all of these controversies that we're talking about before we get into the, the Resident Evil study and then the main bit. Uh, except for, I guess I haven't reached out to um, Matt Galloway yet. I'm going to email him later on for the book, probably get his comment. But yeah. Matt Galloway, he's a reporter for the CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. The CBC, I'm not going to get into all the details because it will be five hours, but um, they have a long-running feud with Gamergate where they keep lying about Gamergate for no reason, basically. And they even have been ordered by the CRTC, the governing body in Canada. Yeah. They've been ordered that they have to start being more fair to Gamergate, and they still gotcha. refuse to do so. Uh, they, they're ignoring, uh-huh. yeah, Esther Inkin, the former C- CBC ombudsman, has ignored the CRTC's orders that they need to yeah. investigate the claims that Gamergate was covered unfairly. Um, they need to investigate those thoroughly. But she completely ignored them, according to Lunar Archivist, who is a, a researcher in this area. Yeah. All right. So Matt Galloway, he interviews Alyssa Mercante on for the CBC. And we don't have to go through the whole article. It's not really that interesting or important. But he's extremely one-sided. He says, Now, Sweet Baby Inc. 
is the victim of a giant organized <laughs> harassment campaign, and gaming insiders say this harassment shows just how toxic parts of gaming culture still are. And they're yeah. warning this toxicity has real-world consequences that gamers and non-gamers alike need to pay attention to. Alyssa Mercante is a journalist and senior editor with the gaming website Kotaku. Alyssa, good morning. So right off the bat, he opens it up with Sweet Baby Inc. is a victim of a giant, giant organized harassment campaign. Mm. But no point does Mr. Galloway provide any evidence for this. In right. fact, the evidence he shows is he plays a clip of a YouTuber criticizing the company. Well, I, yeah. how is that harassment? Like, yeah. They don't <laughs> again. Yeah, that, that's free speech again. Yeah, it's I mean, that's free like, speech. They they yeah. they don't believe in free speech. They don't. They apparently all criticism is harassment in their eyes, and they oh, no I, evidence I would love whatsoever. To apply that for myself. I'd love to say, oh, well, you, you know, wait a minute, you don't agree with me? That's harassment. <laughs> that would my life would be so much easier if I could like pull that on people. <laughs> that would be wonderful. And looks like Melissa Sorry, Conte. I didn't mean to you. No, no, you're fine. Okay. All right, so it looks like Mr. Arcante tries to bring up Gamergate because she's probably yeah. a terrible human being. I, I I don't want to talk bad about human beings. Um, I'll criticize the things they do, but, like, why are you talking shit about Gamergate in here, too? It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, it just seems like unprofessionalism upon unprofessionalism upon unprofessionalism. Mm -hmm. And the CBC, of all places, um, given that they've been at war with Gamergate for a decade and that we've literally – people have literally gone – to their funding hearings and demanded that they do better and that they've been ordered by the CRTC. The ombudsman has at least, not the organization, but the ombudsman has yeah. been ordered by the, the CRTC to investigate Gamergate and do a, and, and treat it fairly because they weren't mm. doing that. Before. Well, the, the French ombudsman, Pierre Tarengo, people say he did a good job, but the English ombudsman, uh, Esther Inken, did a terrible job um, and that's very evident and she's the one who's been ordered to do fair to do it fairly but she didn't even she refused to do yeah. so and she even she left the company uh eventually yeah and and still never apologized never did her job right nothing like that and the cbc yeah. just very brief i'll say the cbc to be clear they knowingly lied about gamergate john bowman yeah. the writer for the cbc as covered in the lunar archivist interview he Interviewed Gamergate supporters, Jenny Barrage and Gina, um, Jennifer Daw, one of whom is a female game developer. And they had a very different story than the story Brianna Wu had. But they completely throw that out. And John Bowman says his editors, his editors told him, get rid of those interviews, just run with the one-sided harassment story. That's what John Bowman mm -hmm. of the CBC says, according to Lunar Archivist. All right. Yeah. So then we've got... Another case of that same exact thing happening. The editors stepping in and saying, you need to promote your story one specific way. Mm -hmm. We have, do you have anything you want to say about the CBC stuff? Um, again, I think it just tracks what other problems I've seen with the CBC, right? I mean, this is, you know, uh, uh, not a problem that is specific to Gamergate, but, you know, I've seen a lot of criticisms of the CBC, you know, as effectively, you know, first off, like, you know, effectively a government arm, you know, to some extent, but also very, very involved in promoting, you know, progressive narratives over anything else, you know, and not looking at things from a neutral perspective um, and such. I, I always think, you know, when I hear the CBC, I, th I always think of the whole, and I think we talked about this before, or just, you know, stop me if we didn't, but uh, the whole, uh, you know, graves that were found on, you know, these schools for Native American children that it turns out there weren't any, you know, or it, 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 no graves have actually been found at this point. And they, you know, promulgated this narrative that there was a genocide of Native Americans in Canada. And, uh, you know, and, and, and of course, you know, history is pretty shitty and there's no question about that but uh, but but largely the the evidence for these graves that supposedly were found on you know these uh, schools residential schools for native american children have not borne out uh and such and uh the cbc has been reluctant to admit that perhaps they gotten the story you know uh, 
wrong, I guess, <laughs> you know, at, at the outside. So anyway, I mean, my point being is, is that, you know, I, I think that the, the, the problems we're seeing with the Gamergate narrative, the problems we're seeing with the, you know, uh, mainstream news coverage of this reflect a you know, wider problem that with news media in general, uh, you know, particularly in countries like the US, UK and Canada. And Canada might be the worst one. I think. I think actually, you know, we have a lot of problems in the U.S. No question about it. But uh, my God, sometimes I think I'm, I'm. You know, and no offense to your listeners who are Canadian, because Canada is wonderful and it's full of wonderful people. But my God, I'm so I'm so glad I don't live in Canada. Well, it, <laughs> it, it, the know? people behind the DEI push, um, a bunch of these DEI companies, they're all funded by one specific person. Actually, Eileen yeah. Loka, a Canadian person, um, and she actually has a whole history with Gamergate too. Not really. Uh, her brother dated Zoe Quinn and then Zoe Quinn falsely accused him it seems okay. of sexual assault gotcha. seven years prior um and this the, her story completely fell apart um gotcha. and there were yeah basically it was almost certainly a false allegation uh he killed himself after he lost his job a few days later oh, after she right. made the claim it was awful yeah. terrible and then that Eileen rings Holoka, a bell. that sounds familiar I think I've heard the story yeah yeah Eileen Holoka inherited the money and okay. then she used that money to fund all these different woke consulting firms with this group called yeah. Baby Ghosts. And so Sweet Baby Inc., a bunch of these other companies, uh, about a dozen different, uh, I think it was like maybe two dozen different companies possibly. They have a list on their website of companies, yeah. all these woke consulting firms. They're all funded by one person or most of mm -hmm. them. A lot of them are. It's, it's, it's not like it's some like natural occurring phenomena. It's, it's one person using the money that they raised from their bro from their dead brother, yeah, their dead brother's inheritance, to promote this agenda. Even though arguably her brother died because of this woke ideology, you could say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And not that you know, I mean, you know, not that every single woke person necessarily believed the allegation without uncritically, but yeah, a lot of them did, and it was woke people who did it to him. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So. Speaking of editors stepping in, have you seen this here? There's Twitter user, you read this wrong. Or your read this wrong, sick. They interviewed Ash Parrish, the writer at The Verge. And they asked Ash why they didn't include the the part of, why, why they, in their story where they lied about Gamergate, the first Gamergate that is, they lied about it, and then they didn't include anything at all about Cabrutus being harassed. Yeah. When asked about this, Ash said, I hear you, and I understand this is where we part, ideologically at least. I'll share the conversation I had with my editors about this, because in preparation for my piece, I struggled with this particular bit, and the conversation I had really helped me understand. Cabrutus and his ilk have a grievance against Sweet Baby Inc. that is rooted in racism and misogyny and has no basis in the reality of how video game development works. That's it, period. And when you get into the nitty gritty of who did what, when, and where, or who did what, when, not obviously the who's and what's that are necessary to explaining the story, that central premise gets lost. And me personally, I have to remember that what my piece is ultimately about. And then she goes on and blah, 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 whatever. But her editors told her not to run with this. The Verge mm -hmm. admitted that they deliberately do. Is it OK to say lied or misled? Basically both. Right. Because either one yeah. of two things. One, they're lying in their article or two, they're lying about lying. So either way, they're lying, mm -hmm. I guess. But mm -hmm. The editors are stepping in and telling their reporters, hey, look, I know that you know what really happened, but I need you to take that out and run with a completely mm -hmm. different narrative instead. Yeah. It, do you think this sort of thing is common? Is this what happened with a lot of these papers or just the one or how common is this, do you think? Well, I think it's, I think it's common. I think, I think it, you know, the, the, it, it's all about the narrative, right? You know, and, and you know, you don't want to... Uh, Put in any details that would change the narrative, <laughs> right? You know, and, and this whole like accusation of like, well, you know, if you don't buy a particular moral path, and that just means you're racist or transphobe or whatever. Of course, that's a very common, 
you know, everybody knows that this is these things are these accusations are thrown around like you know, uh, you know, candy bars at this point. They they have no real you know meaning uh, any longer. Um, and such, but yeah, I mean, you know, and again, you know, we, we've, see, we've seen this with mainstream journalism too, like, you know, during like, you know, BLM, anytime you point out, well, actually, you know, the, uh, um, if you control for class, you know, any differences in race, you know, in terms of, uh, disparities regarding police violence go away. So the, you know, basically the, um, the experience of a poor white man is actually pretty similar to a poor black man, you know, and, you know, to the extent that there are disparities, they're, they're explained by disparities in crime perpetration, right? You know, and, you know, to say that in 2020, <laughs> you know, I mean, I can say it now, uh, but, because I think everybody kind of figured out that, uh, you know, that is true. The taboo has been lifted a little bit. Uh, but to say that in 2020, I mean, you know, the, the news just, you know, even like the New York Times has absolutely refused, you know, to put those important details that would have changed the context it would have changed you know the, the the narrative so i think that is exactly it is that you have somebody you know for various reasons whether it's editors or the reporters themselves who are enforcing you know a narrative uh and it could be the editors it could even be staffers who are threatening to revolt if the uh if the papers, you know, run with something that's counter to the narrative, uh, you know, we've seen that happen too at some newspapers, including the New York Times. Um, that yeah, I mean, this thing you know happens all the time. I mean, it's always why you know you have to be a little bit wary when you read newspaper articles, as you may only be getting, you know, a part of the story that has been curated in such a way as to cause you to develop a certain set of beliefs about that. Um, that story. There's even a word for it, it's, and, I, and, I, and of course I can't remember what it's what it's called. But uh, essentially, the idea of it is like if you actually read a news story about something you know about very well, you know. So if I read a news story about like video game research, or I read a news story about like social media research, which I do, you know, also, and I see a bunch of errors in it, you know, which you know, I, right, right now the big issue is social media. So if I see a news story about social media, I'm like, oh my god, that's so wrong. Oh my God! They forgot this thing. That no, the research doesn't really say that. Blah blah blah. You know, I can say, oh wow, this story got this completely wrong because it was, there's a narrative, and then I flip the page and then I read about like I don't know the war in the Ukraine. I don't know anything about that. Then I just assume that you know, well that they must be on target here, <laughs> right? You know, so sometimes we when we have expertise in an area, we can spot you know when a new story is curated to support a particular narrative, but then we can kind of get some sense of why people are misled because when we turn the page, we have to kind of trust the paper again, right? You know, why would we think that the story on the Ukraine is any better than the story on video games or social media? They're probably just equally rubbish, just that we can spot it, you know, when we have actual uh, expertise. And there's, there's a word, there's actually a technical term for that. Gentleman amnesia you. effect, right? There we go. Okay, yeah, yeah, you got it, you got it. Yeah, yeah, basically, you know, so we go, oh my God, the paper is so, is, is so off base. And then we turn the page and we're like, yeah, they must be right here though. <laughs> All right. Well, we got, yeah. we got two more stories before, well, I guess we got three more stories before we get to the book interview. Are you, are you still have to get out in 50 minutes? Yeah. I still get that eight o'clock deadline. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. So next story up before we get to the book interview and your study and your thoughts on the alien Romulus trailer. Okay. Jules Hardy, she works for the BBC. She says, can we agree that for round two of, quote, this, unquote, presumably referring to Gamergate, it can be the final purge of these kind of gamers. It's 2024. <laughs> I've been arguing about this for decades. Can we have a last full detox of these dudes so we can get back to the positive gaming community we have been creating? So I don't know what kind of positive gaming community jules hardy wants to create but it seems like she wants to create it by doing a quote final purge of her political yeah. adversaries I, I do think that this rhetoric sounds very similar to a lot of other people throughout history who thought that you know they're just one more mass massacre away from utopia <laughs> what do you think yeah, of that... this but, but yeah, but purge language is always is a little always makes me a bit nervous. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing this person, you know, wants to turn the gaming community into something that looks a lot like a gender studies class, right? Yeah, so it's like just get rid of all the undesirables, um, for, which which is really a remarkable failure to like learn, right? In, in a sense of 
if the argument, say, 20 years ago was that game spaces... I'm not saying I agree with this argument, but let's say the argument was 20 years ago that game spaces are not welcoming... You know, they're not welcoming women, they're not welcoming gay men, they're not welcoming other you know, trans individuals then, you know, okay, well, you know, maybe being more welcoming is good, you know, and that kind of stuff. Um, I'm all for that. Um, and then here you have a narrative that's like, you know, get rid of these fuckers, you know, essentially. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's basically the same thing you were complaining about 20 years ago, just reversed, um, you know, on whatever group you don't like, uh, you know, uh, sort of thing. So I'm guessing that's, you know, dudes... Um, or, you know, maybe white dudes, um, but also probably black and Latino dudes who, who don't hate white dudes and are straight, you know, that, I don't know who, who the hell knows what she, which is exactly what she's talking about. But, um, yeah, but it's basically, you know, I want to take my toys and go home and just play with the people I like and everybody else can go fuck off, you know, which is not usually a perspective that works out well, um, historically <laughs> you know what i mean like, so, uh, so and and, it, and, it, and this idea that like if you're like all oh, supposed to be a champion of inclusivity right you know inclusivity like very specifically involves welcoming people who think differently from you and who view the world differently from you it doesn't mean you have to agree you know with uh, these individuals but you have to open up space you know for people that may even very passionately hold opinions that are different you know from uh, uh, our own so i mean I, I think it really belies this whole narrative around inclusivity you know that uh, i think that you know, the folks like this are really tokenizing you know whether it's black people or gay people or trans individuals they're pretending to speak on behalf of these groups but they really don't um, and it's really all about themselves. I mean, they, I think they really just want, you know, the, at least the public, you know, game community or public game spaces to reflect their worldview and themselves, which is actually very elite. You know, these, these are, are, again, you know, people that have you know, gender studies degrees, you know, for the most part and stuff. And they want the game community to reflect that, you know, and those folks should be welcomed into the game community, but, you know, they should not own it. You know, and so it's gatekeeping. You know, it's the same people that complained about gatekeeping ten years ago, and now the gate they want to be the gatekeepers. You know, and uh, and I get it. I mean, again, that's probably human nature to some extent, but it is a failure to learn from. You know, uh, if you are worried about this being a problem in the past, you're just doing the exact same thing you were complaining about. You know, what is it? It's like, I guess it's like that quote about you know, he who stares into the abyss, the abyss stares. I'm sure I'm mangling it entirely, but you know, the abyss stares back into them, or you know, those who fight monsters become monsters themselves. I think it's is that Nietzsche or something like that that I'm mangling so badly. I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I've heard the quote. <laughs> I do have a small, minor correction to make to my own previous comments. I said I reached out to everybody uh, who I'm talking about in a critical way, but I actually I've reached out to Jules Hardy, I've reached out to uh, Melissa Mercante, I've reached out to uh, some other people, I guess, too. But I didn't actually reach out to Ash Parrish or Galloway yet because Parrish has me blocked because she uses the anti Gamergate block list. And, uh, uh, and I don't know. What if I'm on this? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Galloway, I probably will reach out to later. But it, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's so, it's, it's, it's a complete, we've seen this throughout the games press and with these, these people who are losing their minds about the evil Nazi Gamergate 2, whatever the fuck. They yeah. they say, oh, my God, I hated these people 10 years ago. I told them that they should all go kill themselves and go away, and I hate them, and I want them to die, and all this crazy stuff 10 years ago. And I advocated for bullying them and censoring them and excluding them from the Overton window and trying yeah. to do anything – and basically justifying any action towards them whatsoever. We tried right. that a decade ago, and they're still here. But So they failed. They admit that they failed. But then their solution is to just purge more people. It's not, yeah. well, wait a second, hang on. Our tactics over the past 10 years clearly haven't worked. Maybe yeah. we need to reexamine and, and come to the table and have a conversation with people who don't agree with us on some topics. But yeah. rather than do that, they want to have a, quote, final purge, quote, unquote. Yeah. It, 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 it seems like they, they've learned nothing at all. Exactly. Yes, that's exactly it. I mean, and they're basically, yeah, assuming they were, were on target with their critiques of, say, gamers from 20, you know, from the year 2000, you know, whatever, um, then they're just doing the same thing, you know, um, 
if, if gamers in 2000 behave badly towards women and gays and, you know, non-whites or whatever, which I'm not saying is true, um, but if that was true, then, like, why would you just do the same thing? I mean, you know, but, but again, that's what people do, you know, they, they complain about, you know. I don't know. You think about like the you know the communists complain about the capitalists, but when they end up in charge, they're, they're worse. <laughs> if, if anything, you know. So um, yeah, uh, it's it's just you know people people are bad, and they you know the, the more moral they think they are, the worse they actually are. in in, in practice, has been my observation. I think so. Well, and one thing I, too, I said this last night to two people. One person I know in real life. One person online. Um, I said, you know. It seems like if these people had their way, they would try to eliminate people like me by any means necessary, and they would like. I, I'm, I'm like, I, I, I. It seems mm. like again, I'm not trying to like be conspiratorial or exaggerate, but it seems like if these people had ultimate power, they would literally try to genocide their opponents. Yeah. Because, like, all of their rhetoric indicates that. All of their actions indicate that. And they, yeah. they, they, it's like, it's, it's, there's this quote people say. It's not even a quote. It's just something that a large number of people, including myself, have recognized. If you're not having conversations. Yeah. Well, then, what are you doing with your political opponents? Because <laughs> that's yeah, the only yeah. tool you have in a democracy. And if you don't yeah, have that, yeah. you don't have a democracy and you don't have, you don't have pluralism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, I don't know. Is that, is, that, is that hyperbolic? Was that a hyperbolic comment for me, or is that... Well, I, yeah, maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want, you know, to... I, I think there's probably, you know... It was a private I'm a little wary of getting into, like, the literal genocide. <laughs> you know, everybody's talking about, like, everybody's being a little... You know, but, I mean, you know, there, there are examples. I mean, I, I think in any of these communities, you have some unhinged individuals, right? I mean, there was, for instance, the... Uh, psychiatrist from again i don't know if it was like 2020 or 2021 who gave a speech about how like she fantasized about killing white people right you know what I mean? so you, you do get these unhinged individuals and I, I think i think what happens is in these moments when you like take all of the restraint off of a moral movement um you know, you do get like the worst possible people rise to the top in, in some extent. You know, uh, I mean, we, we've seen this with like Palestine, Israel. I mean, you know, there are, you know, legitimate criticisms of Israel, just as there are of Palestinians, you know, but we've seen people go and gas the Jews, you know, at in public, you know, in Sydney and, uh, you know, in other places. Um, so, yeah, I mean, when you take all the restraint off, you know, you do get people who are the most extreme that will rise, you know, to the surface. So, you know, so I mean, I'm not going to say that any of these, you know, journalists like literally want to kill, you know, you know, they see somebody with like a neck beard, they're going to take out their gun and shoot them, kind of round them all up. And, you know, but, uh, you know, <laughs> but, you know, so I'm, I'm going to be generous and say that's probably, they probably mean it like figuratively. Uh, but uh, but yeah, but it, but on the other hand, like you say, in a democracy, I mean, the whole point of having like a constitutional republic, right? And people always hate this, but the, the constitution stops even the majority from doing shitty things, right? You know, the whole point of having a constitution is the majority doesn't always win, um, and usually it's to protect smaller groups of people that otherwise would be fucked, you know, essentially, you know. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you can look at Athens, you know, it was an absolute democracy, and they sometimes voted to kill people, <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they, well, they all voted, you know, so what are you going to do, you know, kind of thing, you know. Uh, so, so it is good that we have restraints on people's emotions and, 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 you know, that we try to keep the most extreme nutbags from being in charge, you know, not always successfully, of course, but, um, you know, uh, and that is the stop, you know, the most extreme people from ending up in charge, you know, otherwise you you do get yeah probably the majority of people that even in this movement would not really want to like kill you know uh, say conservative white male gamers but you know maybe uh, eventually you get to a point where they're afraid to admit that they don't want to kill like a white male gamers because you have people online you know who are considered to be uh, influential who are making these kinds of extreme. You know, comments again. It's a fair way to learn. I mean, because these same people, you know, progressives will point to conservatives, you know, and you get nutbags on the right too who make extreme comments that seem to be inciting violence. You know, even Trump was, you know, whether you believe it or not, you know, was 
was was criticized for this. Um, you know, so inciting violence is bad. But then on the other hand, when our side does it, it's crickets, right? You know, that no, nobody criticizes it or says, well, maybe, you know, purge is a little strong. <laughs> you know, well, it's I, not I just the purge it. language, you know, like, I feel like that's just like one tweet. I feel like, no, yeah. but the reason, the point I wanted to make like with it, and like, again, I'm not, I don't use this kind of rhetoric in my channel. I don't talk like that um publicly but like i had two private conversations with people i brought this up this idea up in passing you know uh yeah. just to run it by and see what they thought and now i'm running it by you um but it, it they have during the first gamergate and today it's very clear that that the gamergate people the people involved in this or people that they don't like people that they perceive as being gamergate or whatever or their enemies yeah. they really have taken this approach where you can do anything to them you can write articles mm -hmm. claiming that they're nazis you can dox yeah. them and they'll like you can you can dox them you can harass them so many of these different journalists too um sam biddle adam sessler calling for beating up gamergate people yeah. using real life violence to threaten these people and put them in their place you know uh and like okay those are two people adam sessler sam biddle where but nobody condemned them nobody was like hey yeah. look that's a bit you need to calm down and and they just they just removed us from their circle of concern entirely which is why yeah. they don't talk to melanie mack which is why they don't talk to people like me yeah because they they just we aren't people to them it seems yeah well i always had the impression that adam sessler drinks too much coffee um so he's a uh... And it comes across a little twitchy uh, to me. That's, that's the, you know, I, I usually I won't, I won't say anything more negative about you know any any, any individuals, but uh, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, you know, some of these folks can be pretty intense, you know, um, you know, both in terms of their the way that emotion obviously drives their behavior, and then also intense in the sort of Manichaean, you know, good versus evil narrative that they have, and. You know, and again, you can see this historically. Once you believe, you know, your side is the good side, and again, we we can see this with, you know, Israel Palestine. You know, maybe to some extent on both sides. You know, that once you come to believe that your side is the good side, you know, and God is on your side, or Allah is on your side, or or whatever else, that and then anything goes. You know, and we've seen this narrative of, you know, people, uh, you know, in, in, in some of these protests saying, well, even the babies are settler colonialists, and so they don't have any rights, you know, to, you know, and they have no human rights, you know, and this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, so therefore the October 7th, you know, um, uh, you know, terrorist attack was, was justified. You can't, you can't engage in human rights violations against people you know, from the bad side, you know, just like we said, you can't be racist against white people or sexist against men because they're the bad ones. So anything you say is basically justified or anything you do is, 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 is basically justified. That's always a very dangerous moral view um, to adopt uh, for yourself because it really does, you know, wash your hands of any responsibility for anything horrible that you do. And again, I'm not saying that, you know, these debates over over Gamergate have in any way, form, or shape, you know, reached a level of the Palestinian-Israeli crisis or anything of, of, that, of, of that sort. But, you know, but the, but the same sort of mentality of, of these are the bad people and we can destroy them, whether that's Melanie Mack, you know, uh, or, you know, the random, you know, person with the neck beard, you know, that I don't like. Uh, I don't know where even the whole neck, neck beard thing came from, but um, I'm just repeating it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's, it is that sense of, you know, we, our side can't do wrong. So when they gatekeep, it's bad. When we gatekeep, it's good. You know, when they engage in prejudicial, you know, behavior, it's bad. When we do it, it's good. You know, if they make racist comments about, you know, black people, it's bad. When we make racist comments about white people, it's good, you know, and, and so on and so forth, you know. Um, and yeah, that's always you know, talking about like slippery slopes and not everybody likes slippery slopes, but you know, that, that is a dangerous, you know, moral position to begin to take because it does invite you into worse and worse, you know, behavior. And we really should try as best possible to, you know, think first about our own behavior and making sure that our own behavior is moral as much as possible. You know, we're all humans, of course, uh, before we start to worry about the morality of, of others, you know, we, we, certainly should worry about the morality of others but you know we should make sure that our own house is in order 
before we start criticizing, you know, others. And if we're engaging in harassment and, you know, racist or sexist language or, or other kinds of things, then complaining about other people doing the same, I mean, it may be bad when they're doing it too, but certainly we ought to try to work on ourselves first, <laughs> you know, to, to some extent. I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's, it's a... Uh, you know, like I tell my students, people are basically bad, you know, and if you understand that people are basically bad and selfish, then the world begins to make a lot of sense. And so, you know, I think you've got people who think they're moral, but are just behaving like humans do, which is bad and selfish, you know, so. Well, we've got a bunch of people watching. What are you doing? Like the stream, people. Also, next topic before we get to the Resident Evil study. Um, Alien Romulus, the trailer just dropped. You said that you, you're a fan of the movies, the Alien movies. Do you want to talk about... Yeah. Um, your experiences with the Alien franchise, and then your thoughts on the trailer that just came out. Okay, so so I, I, I'm going to admit I didn't do my homework. I didn't watch the trailer, <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure it's great. Uh, but you you can tell me about it. But uh, well, I mean, I've I've played the uh, you know the what was it Alien Resurrection video game and died a lot uh, basically. Uh, and I, I'll admit, so my son played it and then I played it. Uh, my son completed it, and then I gave up at one point. There was, uh, I try to remember, this was a few years ago, and it was this one scene where you're in a bunch of labs, and you basically have to, like, hide, you know, while the creature... Wait, resurrection or isolation? Oh, am I, am I getting it wrong? I, I want to say Well, they're, they're, they're both games, but... Yeah. I think it was resurrection, if I remember correctly. Resurrection was from uh, the 90s. Was it the one in the 90s? Oh, I don't remember. I mean, we played it maybe like five or ten years ago. So let me see. Uh, maybe it was Interaction. Um, or Isolation. Right, most likely, right? I have to look it up. Yeah, you're right. You're. Yeah, you're probably right. It's probably oh, no. Isolation, the, but... game, the, fir- the Alien Resurrection game came out in 2000. So it was Isolation, though? I think I think it, it was the one where you're playing as your daughter, as Ripley's daughter. Yeah. If that, if yeah. that helped. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, sorry, I'm mixing up the, all the names of these things, um, which is unfortunately very typical for me. Um, but uh, anyway, there, there was a scene in the in the game where like the alien creature keeps popping out of the ceiling and everything else, and you have to like time everything properly. And like I'm old and twitchy, I just couldn't do it, and I, <laughs> I gave up after a while. Like I'm just going to shoot things in some other game um, where I can where I can succeed. But but I love the movies. I mean, the movies were were, were fantastic. Uh, you know, of course, I was probably I don't know like twelve or thirteen when I saw the first movie, and uh, you know, it was like a revolu- you know, a revelation almost. I hate using that term because it's so you know uh, preppy. But um, yeah, it was it was just an amazing movie, and you know, and the franchise has been up and down a little bit. You know, uh, you know, actually, I, I prefer the first movie to the second. I know that's probably going to make yeah, a lot of your listeners hate me. Uh, but the second movie was also very, very good. I even like the third movie, which a lot of people don't like. Um, and even the, uh, the one where they bring Ripley back. I think that's the fourth resurrection, one. Resurrection, the fourth one. Uh, yeah, that's resurrection. That's where I'm getting well, resurrection yeah. from. In the third movie, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's, that's what it was. Um, I, I knew it was in there somewhere. I, I, I even liked Alien Resurrection, which I think is like a lot of people's least favorite movie. Um, but and then I love the Prometheus, you know, sort of offshoots um, and, uh, and and stuff. Even though I think Prometheus had a lot of holes in the in the plot, but uh, but just the visuals and the and the the, the mood and, and all that was was really really good. So um, other than I never really got into like the Alien versus Predator stuff, but but other than that, I've I really enjoyed the the movie. Um, movies very much, and I and I like the atmosphere of Alien Insurrection. You know, when I played it, I just sucked at it. You know, so <laughs> eventually, you know, like uh, uh, I was just so bad at. It. I was like, uh, this is a, it's a good game, but uh, you know, I, I I'm I'm already bad at a lot of other things. I don't need to go to video games to be bad at something too. Uh, so that that was the end of it for me. Yeah, I I'm. I wouldn't say like I'm a super fan, but like I'm a moderate moderate fan of the sh- of the series. I've I loved the first two movies, um, the third one and fourth one. I've not seen the assembly cut. They say they say that the assembly cut of three is better because they they apparently okay. cut out like 30 minutes of of footage from the movie. Um, and the assembly <laughs> cuts basically okay. like the director's cut where they add that footage back in. Um, yeah. But I, I was a fan, I've not seen that yet, but I was a fan of William Gibson's Alien 3, the original script. They made an audio drama yeah. based on that. It's actually really good. Okay. Yeah. Come on. Um, I liked and, it. Alien 3 was, was was grittier, so I think a lot of people didn't like it for, for that reason. And uh, But uh, but I I enjoyed it, you know. 
I'd have to go uh, back and rewatch three, especially the director's cut version, just 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 to give it a good because it's been so many years. You know, I was a kid when I last saw it, so um, yeah. But I wasn't a fan of Covenant. I was like I, Prometheus was okay, but it wasn't. I was expecting um, an alien movie, and if they yeah. wanted to go in the Prometheus direction, okay, great. But then you have to have a sequel that actually goes in that direction instead of basically being like, okay, we're gonna go in this direction where we're gonna meet the the space jockeys. Um, yeah. But then at the same time, we're gonna like have a sequel to that that basically just abandons that entire plot line. <laughs> like yeah. the Covenant, I felt was a disaster. That might be my, in my opinion, the worst one. I know some people like it, but. I, I liked it, but I but I agree with your critique of it. I, I mean, I, I like Covenant for what it was, but yeah, I mean, it, it was jarring that you have Prometheus, which really, like you said, is, they're going to go meet the space jockeys or whatever. And then, but, but I thought also that, you know, like Numi Rapace, I can't ever pronounce her name, but, you know, it was like this lead character in Prometheus and they just like, you know, just kill her off <laughs> in, in, in Covenant. I'm sorry if that's like a uh, spoiler for some of your listeners, but it's like, you know, you kind of like get to the end of Prometheus. You think it's really going to follow, you know, Nomi Rapace's character, you know, along with Michael Fassbender's, you know, android. Um, Actually, and then he you was get a, the... he's a phenomenal actor. Uh, you... Oh, he is. He yeah. is. He absolutely, yeah. absolutely, Actually, absolutely is. Actually, I shouldn't say Covenant's the worst. Maybe maybe I'll give that to Insurrection just because he is a good actor. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's really good. And I, and I thought for what it was, Covenant was good. And then, of course, it's sort of promising, you know, a, 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 a kind of a follow-up um you know with that which i guess is as far as i know is never going to happen but um but yeah it, it the, the the connection between prometheus and, and covenant was jarring because of you know killing off um shaw you know nomi's nomi rapaces character whatever how you pronounce i can't pronounce her name um but um so that was weird but you know with, with I, I think i'm kind of flexible with the, with those kinds of things and so I was like, oh, well, that's so disappointing that they didn't really follow her character. Um, but, uh, and they took it in a direction, I, you know, Covenant was in a very different direction from what I sort of figured I was expecting. Um, but I still liked it. I, still, I, thought, I thought it was fine. And it still had that kind of vibe that was, um, you know, interesting. And I would have been curious to see where they had gone with it um, from that point on. But, uh, no, I, I, like, I like the series. Like I said, I've never seen any of the, the alien um uh, what the Predator movies, and uh, I don't know that they call. You're not to me. missing a whole lot. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, so, some of the games. Mind. Some of the games are decent. Some of the games are yeah. decent. And I, I honestly, the first Alien vs Predator movie, I thought it was okay. Um, I know, I know, like people shit on it, but I feel like it was. It's an okay PG thirteen action movie. But just bear yeah, in mind, yeah. it's not a horror film, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, and I never, I never really got into the Predator series at all. I mean, I saw, of course, the original Arnold Schwarzenegger movie, but uh, and it was, it was fine, you know, for what it was. The, uh, the only one I really liked, actually, and I know some people didn't like it, but the only one I really liked was the more recent one, uh, where it was with the Comanches. You know. Oh um, yeah, but, that was great, Prey. Yeah, I thought that one was really, really, really good. Um, yeah. But I think some people didn't like it for for one reason or another, but. Um, but I, I thought that one was really, really good. That was that was definitely the best thing I'd ever seen from the Predator franchise, in my in my opinion, of course. Yeah, I loved I loved Prey, and uh, I actually I will say this about the first Alien vs Predator. It's a spoiler. Do you want me to say or no? It's a minor spoiler. Uh, okay, go ahead. I, I, it's not like high on okay. my list. Okay. So all, all right. So there's this scene. They they completely fuck up the Predator lore in this somehow. They they okay. they. So there's this scene where one of the humans. He, so they te- so they're they're in an Antarctic they're on like Bouvet Island or whatever right one of the whaling yeah. islands in the Antarctic circle so they're on this island um, some of the humans go down into this this ancient catacombs or whatever to explore and some of the humans yeah. are on the surface well the humans on the surface get attacked by the predators one of them yeah. though manages to escape and he's wounded he's wounded mm-hmm. really bad but he's still alive and he slides down this tunnel. And then he's, oh, he's, but he's unarmed. He doesn't have his weapon anymore. And the predators, they kill all the ones who are up top who are armed. But then they go down the tunnel and they kill the unarmed guy. Well, that's not yeah. how the predators operate. That goes against their entire code. They're not uh, supposed okay. to kill people. A wounded person who poses no threat at all um, and is not completely unarmed, they shouldn't have killed him. It, it, it goes against the lore. It's bullshit. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> anyway, yeah. uh, 
<laughs> you didn't see the trailer. I guess I'll give my like two cents on it because it's like a one minute. That's, I'm so sorry. No, I, 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 no, I no you're cool. You. This is this is just this is. I like, sent you uh, like so many ball. things. I sent you like twenty different things. So don't you? you did. You did. Yeah, yeah. It was, this was at a, uh, like elementary school all over again. Like, oh my god, it's like Monday morning. I didn't do my homework. You know, and now I'm, you know, <laughs> no, I'm in trouble again. I, I, well, <laughs> it's, it's it's a super short trailer. Basically, you don't see a whole lot. I do think that the aesthetics look really cool. It does look okay. like they're sticking with like the alien aesthetics. Um, so it does look cool in that sense, from what I've gotcha. seen. But uh, I don't like in the trailer that they showed the alien, um, and then they showed the up like a bunch of face huggers. Or it's like, okay. well, it's like I don't think you should. My my personal preference for trailers, at least. Uh, for horror films, especially the Alien franchise, is that you don't show it, you know, or you you you, right, you maybe right. hint, you don't, hint, but don't yeah. show. Like the first movie, the first movie is fantastic in that sense, right? You don't yep. see the alien until like the practically the, <laughs> the end almost. Or I guess what yep. I don't even know when the first time you see them. It might be with see a good shot, not like yeah. a flash of action or like a flash of okay, what's this weird thing? But like I don't think that they should show it like that. I, I think that's yeah. a bad trailer. But whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess you see the baby alien coming out of John Hurt's stomach, but yeah, you don't see the. Oh, know, true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You don't. Yeah, but no, but you're right. I mean, you, you don't see like the full size alien until. Basically, I think not until Ripley is on the shuttle. Like, you know, basically, like you said, towards the very, very end. Yeah, the, you see part of it with Parker, I think, right? But or with um, Parker yeah, and think, Lambert yeah, you, in that scene, but. Yeah. You see, like it's jaws i think yeah kind of like that two-part jaw thing mm -hmm. you know for uh for some and you of it. see it with yeah, brett it's... too i think with a two-part yeah. jaw where very briefly mm -hmm. anyway all right i know i'm not sure we're gonna get to the gamer gate book questions <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh all right you did a study on resident evil um and you interviewed 103 undergraduates at a liberal arts university in Amer in the american south um, 76.7% of them were, were women. Yeah. Uh, so is, is that, is that a good, uh, is that, is that pretty standard for it to be more, not 50, 50, but you know, 70%, 80%. Yeah. Women? That's, that's it with guys. There's a lot of women at universities. Come join us. <laughs> that's just, that should be our first recruiting, you know, thing, you know, it's like, uh, universities are all like two thirds female, um, you know, are very close to it uh, at this point. That's a whole other scandal, actually, is the the, the vanishing men from uh, universities, um, you know, and that sort of stuff. So yeah, yeah, if you're listening, universities, liberal arts universities, that's where all the women are. Uh, they don't have any guys to go out with, so come join us, Stetson University, Deland, Florida. Apply, apply, <laughs> apply. <laughs> help, help me make it to retirement before the university closes down. <laughs> Um, so, but no, it, it is very typical. Yeah, uh, you see a, a lot more, which you know, in, in some ways is is uh, you know, for psychology studies is not great, right? You know, I mean, I'll, just, I'll just say that right out the top. You know, is uh, we we would much prefer a fifty fifty sample of uh, men and women, and it is very hard to get that uh, with a university sample, which is going to lead some of your researchers, uh, some of your listeners, to ask, well, why don't you do some somebody who's not university? And, uh, and unfortunately, the, the answer is that outside of university students, people expect to be paid, and I have no money. <laughs> so uh, university students, we can you know, basically just ramp up the difficulty of our courses, then offer them extra credit uh, to uh, participate in studies. You know, I'm, I'm saying that half-jokingly. We don't really ramp up the difficulty of our classes to do this. But, um, but we can't offer them extra credit, which is free. You know? So that, that's why you know, that so many studies are done with undergraduate students. Is they're, they're there. And it doesn't cost us any money to get them to run through studies. And uh, the downside is obviously then you get a, you know, a sample of people that does not represent you know, the United States uh, general population very well on uh, a number of, of variables. Uh, now, actually, ethnically, we actually were pretty good. Uh, our ethnic representation representation was pretty uh, consistent with the general population. We might have been a little bit high on Asians, a little bit low on whites. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, we're pretty representative. It's just that we were female heavy. And I don't think there's anything wrong with with it being female heavy. I don't think that invalidates the data or anything. I think it's fine. Because yeah. um, like if if it were the case that like people after playing a video game became like sadistic monsters who wanted to torture, which we'll get into in a minute, um, <laughs> not torture, but like cause yeah. mild discomfort, uh, 
to other people on the basis of race like i don't think that yeah. that's like i don't have reasons to think that like oh men would be more prone to that than women or vice versa right i think that'd be yeah. like a relatively human phenomenon um but in this study you asked people to play resident evil some people played resident evil 5 and some people played resident evil 6. now in resident evil 5 if you're not familiar the game is set in africa most of the enemies are black in Resident Evil 6, the game is set oh, in a large number of places, but mostly the United States, I guess. And they, yeah. most of the characters are white. Most of the zombies. So in both cases, you're fighting yeah. mostly black zombies, mostly white zombies. Mm -hmm. And they played the game for 30 minutes. Then they were asked, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is your study, I'm stealing your thunder a little. But Go for it. Uh, they, you asked them... Uh, after the well, you asked them first to answer this. I wanted to, well, we'll get to that. We asked them to fill out this survey about their about their xenophobic predilections, potential yeah. xenophobic predilections. Racism, basically, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then, and then, in addition to the survey, you at the end kind of surprised them with another element, a quote unquote second study that was unrelated, but it was actually part of the same one. Um, yeah. And you ask that, which is like I think pretty standard, uh, I guess probably, yeah. but. Yeah, and they had they all gave informed consent. But in this second study, which was the same study really, you you asked them to you paired them with somebody else. In some cases you paired them with a white person, in some cases you paired them with a black person. Correct. You then asked them to to um give a number between zero and twenty. And this number would be how long their partner, whether they were white or whether they were black, how long their partner would have to stick their hand in freezing cold water, causing pain to that person. Correct. Right. Um, but like a moderate amount of pain, not like not like you're killing them or anything, right? We, like, we didn't pull their fingernails out or anything, yeah. Right, yeah. So. Like a moderate <laughs> amount of pain to the person. Um, and... <laughs> Uh, so what exactly, I guess we'll just ask you what you found with this. What what were the findings regarding the people who were asked to make their partner endure moderate discomfort for a period of time? Yeah, I mean, and, and of course what we were, we're, we were looking for is, you know, just playing the game where you're killing black zombies, make you more aggressive to black people uh, versus playing the game where you are, you know, shooting white zombies that make you more aggressive towards, you know, uh, white people. Uh, in real life. And, and obviously this was, you know, kind of inspired by the whole 2020, you know, Black Lives Matter, you know, all, every, everything's racist, uh, you know, narrative. And I'm, I'm sure there were, you know, we're talking about Kotaku. I'm sure there were Kotaku articles. About, you know, we, got, we have to talk about race and video games, you know, at the time uh, and all this sort of stuff. So, uh, I mean, what we found was it, it was actually pretty interesting. I mean, it, what people I think might think is that um, if you play the game where you shoot black zombies, then you would be more aggressive to the black confederate. We call it confederate. It doesn't mean someone who fought in Gettysburg. It's just the, the other person who's sort of been on the study and has to put their hand in the bucket of ice water. Um, you know, that you would be more aggressive to the, you know, black confederate, you know, essentially. And that is not, in fact, uh, what we found. Um, that we actually found, like, for the uh, black uh, confederates who had to put their hand in the bucket of ice water, it didn't really matter. Uh, which game you know people had played the the real difference was for the white um, confederates um, that when the person was white and someone had played you know the game where they were shooting white zombies that that was the condition where people were were most aggressive uh, actually is they put the and these were all women who, who were the confederates you know so they would put a white woman's hand in a bucket of ice water for you know a, a longer basically you know, somewhere between two to four seconds on average you know a longer period of time uh, and you know uh, require them to be in this like you said moderate you know discomfort uh, for a longer period of time if they had played the uh, uh, Resident Evil Six, you know, with the with the white zombies, and and uh, that was a little bit of a surprise to it. I mean, really, our 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 expectation was usually we see 
nothing, you know, with video games, right? You know, that we don't really, most of our studies we've done with video games, we don't find that video games really have any effect. And, and in fairness, so even in this study for the, the questionnaire about sort of like at what we call ethnocentrism, which is kind of like just sort of general racist attitudes, we didn't find any effect of playing the game on, you know, sort of this ethnocentric, you know, racism uh, sort of thing. But we did find this effect on the, you know, the behavior. And uh, it, it was actually pretty interesting. So I think it was an outcome most people, including ourselves, would maybe not have seen coming, which is always exciting, you know, a little bit. Now, yeah. were these people the Confederates? Were because these are co-op games, both five and six. Were they actually playing the game with the other person, or were they brought in separate? No, they were brought in separate. This was entirely, um, you know. Oh, you know, we said that this this experiment's over, but before you leave, you know, and we had this like cover story, of, like you know. Uh, before you leave, we actually need help with the, like you said, the second experiment. It really wasn't a second experiment, you know, and we just need uh, to have a objective person, you know, tell us how long to put this person's hand in a bucket of ice water because we're testing their pain tolerance, you know. And we actually did, you know, invite the person who is the participant to put their own hand in the bucket of ice water so they could see how uncomfortable um, it uh, it was, you know. So they actually did have to look someone in the face and do this. Now, you know, of course, this is not like knifing someone, right? You know, so it'd be to be fair, this is not like like, you know, the gangs of Chicago don't run around with buckets of voice water, you know, trying to put each other's hands in the buckets and stuff. So, uh, but it is this like mildly aggressive behavior. You're, you're, you're trying to get someone to do something that they, they probably don't want to do. And because you've touched the water yourself, you know that you don't want to do it. So you're making somebody do something you don't want to do. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, and I think that makes it more salient, you know, right? It's not like the Milgram study where you can start to think, well, maybe there's some, maybe the whole story about there being another person is fictional. Like, no, you're actually watching the person put their hand in the bucket of ice water. You know, this is really happening. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of how we did it, you know. And, uh, you know, I think it's important. We were, we're somewhat modest about, you know, again, not applying it to like gang violence and stuff. But I, I think it's still interesting. Okay, I don't understand this graph. So, can you just explain to me, um, the layperson idiot? Can you explain whether one what this graph means, and then two also? Can you break down? You said two to four seconds. So you the, so if the person playing the game, well, first off, I guess we should break it down. So we'll break it down to like four categories. If you can answer for me, real quick, or we can yeah. break it down even further if you wanted to. But uh, we don't have all day. Uh, <laughs> But yeah. <laughs> okay, so so group one, you have people who played Resident Evil Five. Group two, you have people who played Resident Evil Six. Yep. Now, of the people who played Resident Evil Five, if it was a white person, let's say, uh, let's say, mm -hmm. a, a, let's say it's a, we could have to break it down into four categories. They're like white male, white female, and then black yeah. male, black female, and you could do the other races if you wanted to. But I'm not sure if you have data deficient, if you're data deficient there or not. But yeah. anyway, if they were dealing with a white person. And asking them to endure this mild discomfort. If, yeah. If if it, if they played Resident Evil Five and it was a white white woman, it was two to four seconds on average they asked them to do so. It was if they were playing. So uh, you know, I'm trying to think of a or, coherent way. And I, and I should say, like, if, if people want to read the study, it's you know, if they go to my webpage, just just my name, ChristopherJFerguson.com. The study is is freely available, uh, so people can read it, um, you know, for themselves. Um, but, uh, essentially, yeah, I mean, basically if the Confederate was a black woman, again, all the Confederates were women, uh, if the Confederate was a black woman, it didn't matter which game people had played. They would assign her about the same amount of time in, you know, with their hand in the bucket of ice water, essentially. Um, when uh, the participants were playing um, the Resident Evil 5 game and the Confederate was a white woman, they actually assigned a little bit less time in the bucket of ice water. But when the game they played was Resident Evil 6, which has black zombies, they assigned, you know... Oh, no, 6 has white. More time. Well, they yeah. both have white and black, technically, but, like... Five is the mostly black. Six is the most right. Black. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Precisely. Yeah. 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 So it seemed it seemed to be that like for black women there really wasn't a difference. You know that it didn't matter which game you played. You just kind of assigned a relatively medium amount of time. It was eight seconds essentially out of out of a possible twenty. It was eight seconds. 
Um, so, you know, basically, whichever game you played, most people would assign the Black Confederate about eight seconds of time in the, in the ice water. Um, on the other hand, for white women, you see a, a much bigger gap. So if they had played Resident Evil 5, it was closer to about six seconds. If it was uh, Resident Evil 6, it was closer, a little bit over 10 seconds um, was uh, the, the mean. So you see this guy kind of gulf. Uh, between the games for white women only and uh, not not black women. Now the average for if you like comparing like the whites versus the black you know women, the overall average for race was the same. It was basically eight seconds, you know, essentially. But for the black women confederates, it was always eight seconds. For the white women confederates, it varied between six to ten seconds based upon which game they had played. If that makes sense. Well, and you say in the paper that that you're hesitant to draw too many strong conclusions from this. I have a bad habit about doing that. But <laughs> at the same time, at the same time, you do say that the findings were actually, were, were sorry, the findings were not expected um, coming from your department and the, the, the normal kind of findings that you normally come across. Right. So you normally, yeah. normally you wouldn't find things like this in your studies. So, the fact that your study found this specific outcome you found was unusual? Yes. I mean, we've run dozens of studies, mostly in like video game violence, you know, so not, not looking at race, but looking at video game violence. And, you know, through dozens and dozens of studies, so comparing people playing, you know, violent video games versus nonviolent video games, uh, we just don't see much impact, you know. And, and we've studied like sexism in games, so people playing, you know, quote unquote, more sexist. You know, games like Grand Theft Auto is typically the one everybody worries about, you know, uh, versus, you know, a violent but not sexist game like Call of Duty, you know, that uh, we don't we don't see any impact of playing, you know, I, I, and I know sexist is a value laden, you know, term, but, you know, but I'm just going to keep using it, you know, that people that play more sexual sexualized, there's less there's less value label there there. So more sexualized games versus less sexualized games. You know, doesn't impact women's body dissatisfaction, doesn't make the men more sexist. So in a lot of different ways, you know, we've, we've compared games on different things people are worried about. And generally, we just don't see any effect of playing games on people's attitudes or behavior. And so and so it's sort of in that context of like, well, this is like the first time we actually saw like a game have any actual impact on people's behavior or at least appear to have some impact on people's behavior um, after running dozens of studies. Now, granted, this is on a new issue. You know, this is on race, not sexualization, not violence. Um, so maybe there's something sort of special here. But, uh, you know, and like I said, we yeah, we, we, we don't want to make it sound like, well, you know, this this explains everything, you know, kind of a thing. Uh, it's sort of just sort of an interesting finding. We'd, we'd love to see other people replicate it, um, you know, and see if they find the same thing in, in other studies. But, uh, you know, our, our, our thought, you know, which is, is certainly post hoc reasoning to be very upfront about it because we didn't see this coming. Um, so it definitely is post hoc reasoning. Uh, but we kind of thought, well, maybe this is this is kind of related to like the 2020 narrative about like white women's tears and the Karens and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, yeah, there was a lot of criticism of of, of white women, <laughs> you know, that that uh, began to occur. Uh, and some of it like, you know, I mean, a lot of people use the word Karen, but, you know, there have been there have been critiques about that as being kind of sexist, you know, and, and, and racist and and all kinds of other stuff. And, uh, you know, so maybe some of that sense of like, it's OK to pick on white women, you know, that white women deserve it. You know, that kind of narrative maybe is the explanation for why you're seeing this different for white women only. Where, you know, particularly if you're being primed by, you know, race somehow is resulting in, uh, you know, this sense of, um, you know, it's okay to uh, to be more aggressive towards uh, towards white women. Because, but only you know, the people who played Resident Evil 6, though. Right. And that's because uh, that's the one um, that uh, you know, the zombies were, the majority well, of zombies well, were, let's... were white. Let's you know. take your like. Obviously, your this is a hypothesis you've just created. Oh, absolutely! Like, your your, hy your yeah. hypothesis here, like if if it is the case that during times of like political, racial, gender, ethnic, whatever strife, at times when tensions run high, would well, I guess again, you wouldn't have an answer to this because you haven't looked at it. But like, yeah. if it is the case that the reason that the people who played Resident Evil 6 were more 
uncaring, I guess, or unsympathetic yeah. towards the towards the white women in the study. Mm-hmm. Then, because because they played Resident Evil Six, and they're like, "Well, there's already a lot of white people doing white women who do bad things. I don't like white women for some reason, whatever the fuck." Um, yeah, they already have this in their head because of society. Then they play Resident Evil Six, and now they're slightly less sympathetic towards white women after playing yeah. the game. If that were the case, then that would have broad implications for like a wide number of different things, like in periods when black people are looked down upon, or white men, mm-hmm. or Muslims, yeah. or whatever the fuck, right? Any group of people. Um, yep. If it were the case, if they played video games where a majority of the enemies they fought were that, um, yeah. you would expect to see that result. That right, like essentially, like if you if you gave, if you did this study in like Turkey against like Kurdish people, and right. like well, there's a hot yeah. lot of hostility towards Kurds in Turkey. Um, the and, and well, they played a game where you fight Kurdish enemies or whatever the fuck, you know, it's, <laughs> it's something like that. Um, then yeah. then they'd be less sympathetic after playing the game compared to before they played the, like that would be a, an interesting finding but yeah. like again this is all speculation it's plausible it's absolutely plausible and, 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 and the cautionary note is you know just because you find one result for one group doesn't mean you can generalize it out to other groups but but that that would certainly be like an intriguing set of hypotheses you know to study in 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 further in further research you know, so I would definitely, you know, if there are any Turkish researcher listeners who are, who are hearing this and they can find some games that actually sort of fit this narrative or can mod, you know, games that sort of fit this, uh, like what you're describing of, you know, set up a shooter game where the enemies are Kurdish versus, you know, some other, you know, Turkish or some other ethnic group um, that that would be intriguing. I'd I love to see it. Just make sure it's, you know pre-registered if you're a researcher you know what that means um you know um and make sure it's a good study you know basically i I, i'd be very interested to see if this actually does um generalize to other groups of of individuals because uh you know it would be fascinating because like i said mostly when i run these studies of video games i find nothing you know and uh so to find one was was actually kind of interesting and it was it was sort of different from what we were expecting you know even probably different what people would have expected yeah, you because know, they were concerned in, in 2020 all about, you know, sort of racism towards, you know, black individuals. And here we're kind of suggesting, if anything, <laughs> this is the opposite, uh, or at least in some contexts, people are more easily sensitized into being aggressive towards, you know, the white women, if anything. Um, it, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I'd love to see more studies on this. Well, and you, you asked, uh, I see, Chris, I think the, the whole studies BS, man. Here's why, okay? Oh, go for it. Go for it. All right. Here's my big critique. All right. You ask the participants which game you asked them which game was more fun and which game was more challenging. Mm-hmm. People thought that both Resident Evil Five and Resident Evil Six were both equally exciting. I don't mm-hmm. believe it. I don't buy it. <laughs> Do you have a favorite of the two? Uh, I, I've only played six briefly, but I yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I got bored. It was boring. Uh, oh, yeah. um, but uh, I love five and. Uh, yeah, <laughs> but I know that five and six were both like. I know <laughs> six was very poorly received. Let's just say by a lot of people. I can't, I can't, I can't even remember. I've, I played. I played all these games, and I I'll be honest with you, I can't. Uh, all I remember is the of all the all the Resident Evil games. The two I remember, and I played them all. Um, is I remember the trauma of of trying to learn like the tank uh, controls for Resident Evil Four. I think it was. Uh, it was a great game, but 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 I I just for, I almost gave up on it because of the controls. And then of course playing VR in I think it was Resident Evil Seven. Uh, th- that was amazing playing that in a VR system. Um, but other than that, I all I mix up all my <laughs> Resident. This is so many, <laughs> and so many of them are rebooted. Uh, that I mix them all up. But uh, yeah, so I I couldn't even I I couldn't even tell you which one I I, I think I like Resident Evil Five fine. Uh, Resident Evil Six I think is kind of blending into some other games for me to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> but uh, I have it. I need to go play it again. Um, but uh, but this was like most of these people had probably de- never played either one of them before, and um, they only played it for what was it? It was either thirty or forty five minutes. Thirty. I forget. 30 minutes. It was, yeah, it was a relatively brief, um, you know, time. So uh, yeah, I know yeah. it's a, a bullshit a bullshit question. Sorry, but uh, <laughs> they did say that the people who played six thought it was a more thought it was chal- more challenging than the people who played five, though. Um, yeah, yeah. Or no, I'm sorry. Vice have... versa, the people who played five thought it was more challenging than six. Yeah, Which and then is you probably true. 
from what yeah. I've played of both, but I've not played all of six, so I can't say. So we, we just, uh, you know, statistically control for that, you know, in the end. So. Well, and it's good that you asked that question, too, because, like, if it were the fact that, like, this game was, like, ten times harder, and it's like, oh, my God, they're frustrated. They're like, oh, my. Yeah, this is exactly And then, like, it, yeah. then they take that, then they, then they might be like, well, you know what? Fuck it. Five seconds. Screw you. Yeah. <laughs> or yeah. 20 seconds, you know. <laughs> I'm so angry. 20 seconds. <laughs> well, that, that would be an interesting finding, though, too, but you didn't really find that either. Well, I guess you did, right? Because, the, well, no, because people who played the harder game actually were more lenient towards people than the people, well, towards white women, at least. Um, yeah, well, we didn't, we didn't, yeah, but we, you know, that's a, we can do like a statistical control for that. So we really weren't looking at that as a, as a primarily outcome. So, um, you know, we just use that as a control variable. Um, so we didn't have to worry about it. Uh, and I, I, I won't bore your listeners with talking about the like statistics. <laughs> how well, to do that. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to bore them because I have a couple more questions I wrote down. Uh, okay. one, what is a multi-ethnic climate inventory? And two, what is coefficient alpha 0 0.83? What does that mean? <laughs> so the, uh, my, what was it? The, uh, the, the first one there is the, uh, multi-ethnic climate inventory is a survey of what's called ethnocentrism. So it's basically a race, it's basically a racism scale, but it is sort of neutrally worded so it can apply to all groups. Uh, in other words, it doesn't say I, I don't like black people. It says I don't like some other races or cultures. So basically anybody can take the survey and end up scoring high in it, you know? So, uh, um, so basically it involves a preference for one's own ethnicity, you know, compared to others. So if you're black, you prefer to be around black people, not white people, not Latinos, not Asians. If you're Asian, you prefer to be around Asians, not whites or blacks or Latinos, so on and so forth. Um, so it's just kind of a neutrally coded racism scale, uh, basically. Uh, coefficient alpha, that definitely is inside baseball. That's basically a measure of reliability. How reliable is the measure? In this case, uh, you're mentioning that one about the multi-ethnic climate inventory. So, so how reliable is that as a scale? You know, does it actually reliably measure, you know, this this variable? You know, and coefficient alpha is basically, oh god, it's hard to exp explain in a in a coherent way that would make sense to, to to you know most people that aren't in in stats. But you can kind of think of it as, and this in, and the actual statistician is going to be mad that I put it this way, but it's almost like a measure of how much each of the individual items on the scale correlate with each other so that if you say like i don't like being around other races and cultures and you say true to that you will also very likely say true to the other items on the scale like i don't want to do social things with people of other races you know basically that you're going to answer most of the questions fairly consistently with most of the other questions uh if uh that makes sense and that's just one sort of easy way of measuring the reliability of a scale with a sample of individuals. That was really way down the rabbit hole. Of, okay. and, uh, and I know you, I know you got to go and play some Dungeons and Dragons, <laughs> but uh, I yep. do want to, I do want to um, ask too. So your, your study found that base, well, so the, on the questionnaire, the ethnocentrism, multi-ethnic climate inventory, the 10 item Likert scale um, survey that you asked people to fill out, yeah. Are you asked them before and after playing the game or? No, no, only after, only after. The, the problem with asking people too many questions too many times is eventually they start to figure out the hypothesis of the study. Um, and then, uh, and then they give you answers that fit the hypothesis. So you have to be kind of careful. Well, let um, me ask you, know, you then yeah. you've seen my, you filled out my, my neutral cert. Well, they're all the same, but my, my gamer gate optional battery, uh, yep. how did I do in creating? Oh, I, th I had a lot of fun taking it. I mean, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was long. Um, uh, but, uh, I remember like, cause it was on like, it was like multiple pages. I mean, I was like nine or 10 or 11 pages. Something like that. Like, no, oh, it was wow, 22. Was I think no 21. I think. Oh, it's 22. Oh, gosh, 21. Yeah, black okay, <laughs> I, I did take it all. I swear I took it all, but, but it's funny cause I was going through it and, and, you know, I was thinking like, okay, well, you know, somewhere in here I'll stop because I think it was, it saved progress or whatever. Oh, you know, in theory. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in theory, in theory, yeah. So it was like, I'll, I'll stop somewhere and then I'll come back to it. But I actually had so much fun taking it um, that um, the, the, that, uh, that I did the whole thing in one sitting. Um, so I actually had a lot of fun. And, uh, and of course, the best question was asking about how, how much I liked myself. 
essentially. Um, <laughs> so I, I rated myself very highly, and I and I do suggest your listeners also rate me very highly. Um, well, they're but, only um, the people who I interviewed are taking it. Just a heads up. But <laughs> oh, I see, I see. Okay, yeah, fair enough. Fair I'm enough. comparing my sample with yours too. If you saw um, a lot of the questions, not all, but uh, some of the questions I asked were the same ones you asked especially yeah. regarding demographic data that way i can i can match my results basically i guess you could say i'm trying to replicate your study to some extent um yeah you're in glasgow's work yeah. yeah yeah so i guess we'll see we'll see how good of a job you did or how good of a job i did or actually it doesn't really work yeah. that way because we don't because if, if we get divergent answers well yeah. multiple things one it's a decade on uh two yeah. two um it could be the case that one of our studies is wrong, but we don't know which. Or three, it could be the case that I don't have a representative sample of Gamergate people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we, we all know if, it's, if there's a diversion, so I'm right and you're wrong, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, no, I mean, like, honestly, I, honestly, that's pr you have way more people than me, uh, for one. And two, I, you know, I, I do think also, um, well, I should shoot him. <laughs> I don't know what I think. Uh, okay. <laughs> Admitting but, it is the first step. But I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know what I'm going to expect from this. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I have a representative sample of Gamergate people. When I, I've asked, I've asked one person, I'm like, hey, do you think I do? And they said, yeah, absolutely. Um, but like, yeah. look, I, I got like what? I'm interviewing what? 50 pro GG. The, the neutrals and the antis, forget about it. That's data deficient. Yeah. No question about it. Especially since the only anti-gamergate people were talking to me for the most part, except maybe like nine tails are like the yeah. moderate anti-gamergaters. They're not right, like, it's right, not right, like, right. it's not like the moderators of gamer Gazi are jumping in and being like, Oh, Hey, I'm, I'm happy to help <laughs> help you with yeah. your book and do an interview. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm happy yeah. to tell my story. Uh, it's the moderates. Yeah, so, like, I even even if I had a lot of anti gamer gators, um, I only have but like nine or whatever, something like that. Yeah. Even if I had more, um, it would be the more moderate people, I think. Right. So right, it's yeah. it's gonna it's it's not gonna be a representative sample of anti GG. Fair. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyway, uh, last question because oh. I know you got to go. Um, I know that you have the, the Christian symbol in your Twitter profile. Easter is coming up. Do you want to talk about your Easter plans or anything like that? Yeah, it's actually, uh, um, oh yeah, that is, an, yeah, I, I love Easter. So, uh, I'm, I'm not, a. yeah, my, my wife is probably more into the religious side of it than, than, than I am. I'm, I'm a optimistic agnostic as I sometimes say. Um, but, um, no, we're gonna we're we're gonna have uh, my mother over, uh, and we're gonna have a uh, Easter uh, lunch. Um, my wife will probably uh, drag us to church <laughs> for the for the afternoon. We're like I'm, I'm a very much a, a Christmas and Easter church goer, uh, you know, kind of guy. And then um, yeah, we're gonna have a lot of candy, uh, so it's gonna be a lot of fun. And then we'll probably watch a whole bunch of like horror movies or something like that. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense, for it. <laughs> but it's what we like to do. So. All right, all right, and and this is a long shot, but if the makers of the new Alien movie are watching this, just make yeah. the characters smart and don't treat the audience like they're stupid. Okay, I think yeah. that was my main issue with Covenant. Um, if you yeah. want, I'll give you the final word. I know that you were want to talk. About, if you want to say something about Covenant and defense, you can. No, I don't know if it, you know. It's not. I'm not going to die on that hill one way or the other. No, it it was good. My my comment, if they're if they're listening, is try to make the movies actually coherent with each other. <laughs> like you know, if you're going to promise us, you know, that you're going to you're going to follow Shaw's character, actually follow Shaw's character. Don't just kill her off in the next movie. Um. Uh. And uh, if if you're promising us some kind of reveal, um, you know, about what's going to happen, you know, with uh, you know, this uh android and his little crew of of uh naive humans and the next movie you know actually give us that movie not not a third movie <laughs> that just kills everybody off and then starts with a whole different thing <laughs> all right well thank you so much chris and unfortunately we didn't cool. even get to the gamergate book interview question we didn't no, ah! I, know. <laughs> I well but honestly you know i'm fine if we schedule it again but i honestly yeah. i feel like next time we should really try to focus on that mostly we maybe do a couple light items if there's major news stories um, yeah. World War Three starts or something, right? But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I cool. Thanks for coming on. Go have fun playing D and D. 
Um, All right. Watch this, like the stream, comment, subscribe if you haven't, and we're gonna go raid uh, somebody. <laughs> if I can find out how to do that. I... <laughs> there we go. All right, we're gonna raid. Short Fat Otaku. Go say hi to Dev, everybody. He's playing N64 games. <laughs>